Welcome back to the second installment of the Modern Times podcast. Thank you for listening to the first episode. We have almost 100 views on YouTube as of now, and the Facebook page has taken off, and it uh, looks really good. Uh, Anne and Sarah, what do you think about the first episode? How do you think it I turned think, out? I think it went really well. Uh, uh, we had a good conversation flowing. It was very easy to listen to and fun, and it didn't sound like we were debating too much. We were just like, we all had our own opinions that gelled well together. I enjoy, actually, I enjoyed it just listening to it and, uh, you know, realizing that we had like three different kind of perspectives, but it was just, you know, Chaplin fans just having a conversation, you know, um, it wasn't anything like anybody could have just tuned in and just picked right up to what we were saying that they didn't have to go, you know, to the beginning and, you know, so it's just, like I said, it's just, you know, Chaplin fans just talking about about him, and you could kind of feel the admir- admiration that we do have for him, you know, that... I, I feel like um, when I was going back and editing the whole thing, I found myself becoming interested in the conversation we had already had. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're a, a part of something, like when you're recording something, it's I think it's one thing, but then I was listening back to it and thinking, oh, I'm probably going to sound stupid or whatever, and I was mm-hmm. listening back and thinking, oh, this is actually pretty decent. Right. And I found myself yeah. hearing things that I didn't hear the first time. So right. I think, Absolutely. I think that's a good sign. Yeah. And it, it was fun. It was fun. So and it, it really flowed well. Well, great. Well, hopefully it continues that way. We started a Facebook page for the Modern Times podcast, and it's mm-hmm. a group page. So if you want to be added to that, just go over to Facebook and uh, type in the Modern Times podcast, and it should pop up. Basically, what we did for the first episode was we talked about what our favorite Chaplin film was, and what films we would recommend for someone who has never seen Chaplin before. And we got a lot of responses and a lot of um, comments that I personally wasn't expecting. Yeah, uh, lots of different variations. And all either his like late feature films or his early shorts. There's a lot of variety. So let's check out the Facebook page and see what the fans have uh, said about all of this. A lot of people had an affinity towards the 1942 sound version of the Gold Rush, which I did not expect. I don't think any of us expected that. (laughs) A friend of mine who actually commented, um, H.T. Ellis, and and I know that I know this is how she feels about the 42. She says, "Always, always, 1942 Gold Rush. It's the first of his I saw, and it not only won me over, but changed my life for the better." It all stems back to that one film. And I think really what she's saying is that, you know, she became interested in the film, and then she went on to Facebook and Tumblr, and, you know, she found this whole community of people, you know, and just through his his films, you know, there's that connection. And the 42 one, um, like I, I we were discussing earlier, is the one that the casual, the new fan uh, it was more familiar with because that's the one that Turner Classic Movies showed. So they didn't realize. You and know. also, and it also there's also an affinity to your first Chaplin film. It it has like a special place in your heart. Like there's a special place for the Great Dictator for me because that was my first Chaplin film. Right, right. Well, I th- I think that what shocked us the most about that though is that a lot of Chaplin purists hate that version because yeah. of the edits that Chaplin did to it later on and um, the narration, you know, making it into a... Would you consider the 42 Gold Rush a talkie or a weird a weird hybrid of the two? I, th- I don't... I wouldn't call it a talkie. It's just narration. I think is. I think he changed his mind about it because I know he and Georgia Hale had an affair, I believe, and that must have, like, bothered him later on. So he just wanted to forget about it. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's why he changed. He actually tweaked the storyline, and he actually yeah. made her more sympathetic in the 1942 version. Because if you look at the original one, she was really not a nice person, no, not and, at all. and she mocked him, and you know no, they she, was, she was a gold digger, right? And and you know so it it kind of tweaked 
the uh, the storyline. And I, I just think personally, if you look, it's not just the Gold Rush. It's so many of his films, he went back and edited, and I just think he was never completely satisfied. You know, he always had to perfect. The Tramp in the in in the uh so, you know the original version, you know he was so much different than like the 1914 Tramp, which he kind of was. But in the in the Gold Rush, I mean, he was really pathetic and sad and lonely. And when he tweaked it, he he didn't he, he was less like that. You know what I'm saying? And and he made her more sympathetic. Well, the um, the biggest change I feel in that version is when um, Georgia gives her boyfriend the letter saying that she's apologizing and she's sorry. And he right. takes her letter, gives it to the waiter, and tells the waiter to give that letter to Charlie. So Charlie's under the to impression the Charlie's under the impression yeah. that the letter came from her when it didn't, which right. makes it extra pathetic. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, you, you, you're embarrassed for him because he's, like, falling. When he sees her, he's falling all over her. And if you look, even in, in the 42 version, she's, like, repulsed by him. Like, when he goes up and he's kissing her hand and she's, like, her body language is kind of like, oh, my God, you know. So, yeah, it it, it does. It, it The original one just makes so much more sense. But in, in the know? 40s version, they almost omit that entirely and they make it seem like it went straight to Chaplin on purpose. She sent it straight to him on purpose. Right, right. The thing is, is that at the very end of the of the 42 version, when he's going up the steps, he kind of trips, like he slips on it. And then in the silent version, it's, it's just interesting how he, he picks different takes, you know, because in the original version, he's just going up the steps, and then they go up there and have their picture wasn't, taken. But it wasn't the um, 42 version recorded, uh, isn't it a completely different camera angles than the original? Because they had like an A, they had an A camera and a B camera, and when he went back to edit right. the '40s version, he used most of the scenes from the B camera, which was at a slightly different right. angle, right? Different angles, yeah. right? But that's you know, um, it's just interesting that that people do talk about the, the 1942 version and and the editing, but like I said, there were so many of his films that that he went and re-edited, so. And I think he was appealing to a talking audience by narrating. Although it was, was kind of strange to me, he narrated everybody's part. Well, that's, you know, he narrated, at the end of the day, that's what he always wanted, though, was to be every character. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So that was a shocking. Uh, a lot of people were into the the forty two version, which I guess if you're mm -hmm. you know not familiar with silent films, mm -hmm. that would be the way to go to kind of give you a segue from what you're used to hearing in a movie into a silence. Mm -hmm. So at the end oh, of the yeah. day, I don't think it's that bad of a choice. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a post by Gisela Gambini, and I agree with her. I hope I'm saying her name right. Uh, the first Charlie film I would show to someone new to silent films and new to Charlie Chaplin would be a short, and I think it would be behind the screen. I think this film has different things going on that keeps the viewer interested and makes them wonder what's going to happen next. It has several funny scenes as well as a little bit of romantic scenes with Edna towards the end. Because uh, I think some people get overwhelmed when they watch a silent film for the first time. Of course, there are other Chapman films that are great to show to someone new. So we've decided that this episode we're going to talk about seeing Chaplin live and what it's like to see a Chaplin film live in a theater with an audience and how it differs from seeing it on just, you know, a TV, a DVD mm -hmm. screen on your TV. Right. And so all three of us have experiences with that. Um, we'll go ahead and start okay. with Anne, and I'd like to hear what Chaplin films have you seen in the theater and what was the response the, to them? The first one, um, actually, it was two at the same time time was at the, the Tampa Theater, um, and I think I discussed, you know, uh, the history of that theater. It was uh, built in 1926, has been fully restored. So you really get a feel for what these people, when they went to the theater, it was an event, you know, and it just, it was so beautiful, and, and I actually felt like I was almost transported into time because I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is what it was like to, to see the movies back then. It was, you know, a big event. 
um, I, and they showed a dog's life and they showed um, city lights. One thing I found interesting is if you go to see um, a silent film, a lot of times in, in, in the Tampa Theater, they have one of those, I think they're, they're called Whirliters, you know, uh, the organ comes up from uh, the you know, down below and, you know, they play it along. Right, along with the movie. My understanding is any Chaplin film that's shown has to have the um, the recording that he did. They can't show a Chaplin film with the Warlister or, you know, um, accompanying it. It has to be his score, you know, in, in order for, for it to be uh, to be shown. So, um, A Dog's Life and City Lights. Now, at this point, um, it was six months into my... Well, actually, it was a year into me getting into Chaplin. But it's been six months since I started my blog, so it it was like I, I was trying to observe what was going on, and so I I can post about it, and also just like um, we've mentioned in, in our private life, most of the people we know are just not into it, you know, and so when you get around people that are, it's like you know, really to see it on the big screen is really how he made his films, you know. With that in mind, um, well, they all did. But some films, you know, you could watch on TV and really enjoy them. And you do enjoy Chaplin films on TV, but when you see it on the screen, you catch so many, you know, he's very subtle, you know. So you catch so much more, you know, seeing it on um, the big screen. And uh, there was um, a scene in, in a film's life that sticks out in, in my mind. Edna um, came out after she'd been fired and she had this little hat on. And um, I've often wondered, and I think Chaplin was involved in every aspect of his films. I mean, there's pictures showing him with his hands in, you know, like Paul at Goddard's hair. I mean, he was involved in everything. And I really think he was involved in the selection of, of her costumes. And sometimes she was a gorgeous woman, but sometimes <laughs> those costumes just left a lot to be desired. <laughs> They're just styles of the times, almost. Yeah. Things that look good that they thought looked good back then, but and when in she retrospect, came out, they don't really yeah, she hold got up fired, too well. She had that the little hat that struck people so funny, and I guess because I'd seen at that point a dog's life a, a few times, you know, I just figured it wasn't a big deal to me. But they, that struck yeah. them funny that hat, you know. And then after that was City Lights, and uh, that was just spectacular. That was at the Tampa and, Theater, um, too, right? There was a woman, I mean, everybody was laughing, but there was one woman in the audience that every time I heard her laugh, she got me going. <laughs> and it's, it's strange because, you know, I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I laughing out loud here? But when I'm by myself, I'm enjoying it, but I'm not busting out laughing. It's just that because you're around other people you know what I'm saying and they think it's funny it's contagious and she just oh I mean she really made the film so much more enjoyable because she just kept laughing and laughing that's wonderful so City Lights was uh, interesting because I saw that at the Tampa Theater too and if you ever get a chance to check out the Tampa mm -hmm. Theater it's really cool it was built in 1926 and it's all original inside and they still have um, pieces uh, from when the talkies first came in. Uh, they had like these little telephone booths down on the first floor. There, I guess they were telephone booths that if the sound was running out of sync upstairs, mm -hmm. they could call right. them from downstairs and tell them they had to adjust the um, sync synchronicity of the wow. of the film. So all that stuff is still there, and there's like all these statues and things, and it's got this real Spanish. Uh, design to it and there's no better way in my opinion to see a movie like that than in a in a theater that's cool and there's so few of them left it really is there's so few of those theaters left most of them became parking lots in the 70s nobody foresaw that you know people would have this renewed interest you know years later so that's really you know really sad that that so many of them have been lost to uh progress yeah like those old movie theaters that are just elegant and exquisite they're definitely of their time they're more like places for nostalgia than places that people go to routinely nowadays now that people have 
television and right. computers. It's all about convenience. And the thing is, with uh, with the Tampa Theater, and I believe in the other ones that are still um, still out, like a lot of times um, they're funded uh, privately. Um, so it's not like a real business where if they don't make in if they don't make a certain amount of money, they're they're going to go under. They're preserved so that they'll be there for years and years. You know, is the um, is the Tampa Theater historically preserved under the National yes. History? That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was named actually. It was named one of the top ten uh, theaters in the world, you know, because uh, of the way that it's been uh, preserved. So, yeah, it was, you know. And then, um, actually, last year, and, and that's where I met Nigel, they showed the Gold Rush, and they had an orchestral uh, screening with it. And that just was the best of, like, both worlds. And it's just, but you're also trying to absorb everything that's going on around you. And, uh it's hard, you know, because I'm watching the film, I'm watching the musicians, and then I'm listening to people in, in the audience, you know, reacting um, to Charlie Chaplin. I met the um, orchestra uh, leader. I was really surprised to realize that he really didn't know anything else really about Charlie Chaplin. I mean, he he did the score, and he did fantastic with it. And he said it was very difficult because... To do music to a movie, and then you also have to add sound effects, you know, like um, the gun going off when Black Larson is, is you know, shooting those uh, those sheriffs. And so it was very unique for him. He had never done it before, but he really didn't know that Charlie Chaplin had, you know, scored for all uh, of his movies. Yeah, I was there too for that. And the, uh, like I said, the gunshot sound effects were just a little bit off. But at the same time, you have to remember that this is a, a live it's a live event, you know, and it's like when you go to the movie theater right. or when you go to a Broadway show oh, and there's a slip up right. somewhere, there's a little something that's not, that's off. You as an audience yeah. right. experience right. that together. And, you know, everyone's kind of in on the joke and everyone's kind of in on the, oh, this is just live theater. How I feel about it is, is live movie screenings, uh, like silent films with live orchestra scores um, playing at the same time are more to right. me... And a, a live event than they are just a, a movie screening. I would say they're closer right. to like a Broadway show than and the they funny are thing to is seeing the just a movie. Between, like someone, a piano player looking at the screen and just playing right. along, going with the mood of what's happening in the scenes versus accompaniment, like the sheet music they have to follow all times so precisely. Both of them are two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Follow like a certain pattern, I, I guess. Yeah, it's easier when you have a piano player, a piano player back in the day that could just kind of play whatever they wanted. Right. They could play along to the movie um, with whatever they felt like, with their own personality, versus when, you know, Chaplin right. sent a score to a movie theater to play that exact thing instead of what a piano player would normally play. So there's definitely differences, but it's cool to see... Chaplin films with different soundtracks because I've seen a few of them uh, with different mm -hmm. live right. musical scores, ones that have been made up on the spot and ones that have been uh, scripted. And it really gives a different atmosphere depending on the music that's being played. It really gives it a different atmosphere. And, the interesting and it makes thing it feel like you're seeing a, the same movie but a different way, if that makes sense. Scenes back in, they had to actually reconfigure the entire score. Because the movie is now longer, so they, they they had to do that for the DVD, you know. Um, and when they did it, you know, uh, the or orchestral screening, um, the, the, it seemed. I mean, and I'm a novice when it comes to music. I, I just know what I like, you know, and what what I feel when, when I listen to music. But he just had a thing where, you know, for instance, in City Lights with uh, the Blind Girl. It was always that once that once uh, theme, that one song that played whenever you seen her. So he had everything so precise. Like I said, the orchestra leader said that this was really one of the most difficult things that he really had to do because it was something that you never really had an opportunity to do, and it really opened his eyes to how musical that Charlie Chaplin was. Even though he didn't read or write music, he knew music. You know what I'm saying? And you know, the way that he composed, um, you know, it was kind of like he knew what 
he knew what it sounded like in his head, and that's the way he wanted it. Exactly. You know. So, what would you say oh, is the difference between yeah. seeing a Chaplin film at home the versus seeing it with the audience? It's not just the laughter. You, you, the you laughter feel is people, infectious. You know, uh, mm -hmm. feeling um, the film, if, if, if that makes sense to you. You know, certain, I mean, oh, I mean, the most heartbreaking scene in The Gold Rush is when he gets stood up. Oh, my God. I mean, that just kills you, you know, because he's just sitting, standing at the door and, you know, you can see the visible, like, you know, uh, thing in his throat. You know, he's, like, choking back tears. And people were, like, affected, you know, like, they're like, oh, my God. You know, I heard people, like, in the audience were really affected by that. It was just so sad. So it just it just heightens it, you know, and it just, you know what it is? It kind of reaffirms to me, like, yes, you know what, he's just this magnificent person. And I'm not the only one that thinks that, you know, not that that would change my opinion, but it's just nice to know that so many people, this is, the Tampa Theater was practically sold out. And that was, I think that's 1,400 seats. I mean, he does have that ability to still draw, I mean, which is, you know, uh, phenomenal. A hundred years later, still going strong. I took a couple of friends there when they had the restoration of Metropolis, and they were blown right. away by it, and they had never right. seen a silent film and before. And I said, you know what? If you're going to get into this timer. kind of thing, this was the movie to go That's to. So amazing. But it was intense. Because, it was intense. And the effect, at the end of the movie, my friend goes, That's one of the best movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> so I've Sarah, only seen oh, one Chaplin film in a theater. Uh, Sarah, it was tell at, us about your experience. Uh, it was Shoulder Arms, with seeing. and it was shown at the National World War I Museum. Because Shoulder Arms is a World War One era film, also about World War One trench life mm -hmm. during the war, and it was uh, satirical, very funny. I was one of probably less than ten people in that theater. Me, my dad, oh. probably three or four other people. Very small turnout, but I just enjoyed getting to see Chaplin on the big screen. And that it's a very large screen that the National World War One Museum, and it was delightful, and it made sense to show that film at that museum, of course, and I just enjoyed it completely. My dad had never seen that film before, and he really enjoyed it. So I converted him, I guess, even though he knew about my uh, chaplain fanaticism or whatever the word is right yeah <laughs> wasn't it true when they showed shoulder arms for the first time that chaplain yes. uh distributed right. it for free to yes. hospitals uh where a lot of the veterans were recovering and some of the guys that couldn't sit up they would actually project it onto the ceiling so i have this image in my head whenever i watch shoulder arms of a soldier all wrapped yeah. up in a body Probably. cast like a mummy oh, yeah. and staring at the ceiling with the film being screened up on the ceiling. Blog, so. And um, it's a magazine cover, and it shows a soldier laying in the bed, and up at the top is Chaplin. It's not shoulder arms, but that that's just a magazine illustration, but it is a Charlie Chaplin film. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see the little tramp. And so it it is true that, you know, um, they would uh, – he would – distributed to um, to hospitals. And mm. a lot of the veterans, because the irony is shoulder arms came out three weeks before the, the war ended. The arms, right. Yeah. So the war was just about over anyways. And right. he came out with it. And But since a lot of people had lots of men from um, uh, Europe and America, all over the world, not just had experienced the Great War, as they were calling it, the war to end all wars. Like, they needed some humor. It was tough. Oh, yeah. It was the beginning of modern warfare. And that film just touched on a, a different aspect of And since Chaplin, and Chaplin got a lot of criticism for not joining in the right. really British Army. And he got lots of criticism from media and the fact of the matter is he couldn't he could not have joined anyways. He was right. too short. Uh he gets five foot five, I believe. <laughs> Way too short. But he instead it, it's better that he stayed back and made right. movies because he right. 
his movies helped with selling Liberty Bonds, and he went on a big Liberty Bond tour with Doug right. Banks and Mary Pickford. So that's how he contributed to the war. Then better than like him taking arms and fighting along the, the western. You know, I found it I- ironic that um, you know he got flack for that and for not joining the British Army, but yet. Many people in Hollywood at the time and many people in his stock company, you know, his stock uh, players were from Britain. And I I used to wonder, like, well, why aren't they getting flack? Like, why aren't they being, you know, why aren't aren't you serving? It just seemed that um, at that point, Charlie Chaplin had become so world famous. And, you know, the old saying, you know, you go up and then you have to come down. And I think that's the first time that people started criticizing him and, you know, he was yes, 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 but yes. Buster Keaton joined. He was an right. Old. He was an easy target. But he had right. But like you said, Sarah, he did more good raising war mm-hmm. bonds and yeah. making those films than he could have ever it done more- picking up a weapon and, and going out somewhere. I, I did get to see that. That Definitely. was in. So that was Thanksgiving you went and saw Chapel in the musical when it was uh, on my Broadway. dad took me to New York for the first time. And that was the wow. thing I wanted to do. Uh, yeah. That I wrote Chapel in the musical. We had third row seats. It was shown at the Ethel Barrymore Theater, which is a very, very tiny and very, very old. It was, uh, it starred, uh, Rob McClure as Charlie Chaplin, and he was fantastic. And it was the first time I had ever seen someone, someone besides Chaplin do the tramp, the tramp shuffle or walk or whatever you want mm-hmm. in person. Right. And I was just mystified. It was spectacular to witness. I enjoyed all the music, uh, which I haven't listened to in a while. I own the soundtrack. And it was a, and unfortunately the, the musical did not, was not received well by critics, but audiences adored it. It was terrific from beginning to end. Stylistically, uh, it had a black and white tone, like grayscale, Mm -hmm. like all the costumes and makeup were in, as if it was a silent black and white movie. That's what the art direction was meant to be. Right. I remember uh, seeing when it came out, and I got really excited, and I wanted to, to right. at some point, yeah, make it, right. get a chance Lesson. to go to New York and see this show. Do you- and it was only on Broadway for about a year, maybe not even that long. I, oh, I would see it again in a heartbeat. It so was- maybe you- at this point, now that it's done on Broadway, maybe they'll start touring it around somewhere. Now, Sarah, how did that film based on Chaplin's life. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. not that film. How did the musical accuracy. differ well, from like, I was concerned the, that uh, Richard the Attenborough would just film be like a musical version of the Bible. Accuracy. Check. That's what I was mm-hmm. expecting and a little bit worried about, but it wasn't. Uh, there were some things that differed from the biopic that were uh, in the musical or were not in the musical. For instance, the quote-unquote uh, antagonist in the biopic was J. Edgar Hoover, Versus mm-hmm. in the musical, the antagonist was Hedda Hopper, who was a big, like, uh, and she, but she was, she was in his life. She was, she was brutal to him. Oh, First, you know, um, yeah, mm-hmm. brutal. Oh, yeah. Personally. Yeah, absolutely. And the woman who played her, I can't remember, can't remember her name off the top of my head. She was incredible. She had a, she had this great solo song that, just sticks really well with the musical and called uh, What You Gonna Do When It All Falls Down, and she just belts it. It's And you can imagine her actually singing that song, mm-hmm. the wheel had a hopper. Oh, I'm wondering that, you know, because that's what she wanted him to fall. But, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, that is funny. <laughs> it's hard to take someone's yeah. life, especially someone like Chaplin, yeah, that right. did so much down. and was and around they- for so long, and condense it into a show that's even three hours. There's a lot of things that um, are edited out of the, the Chaplin biopic, you know, like that scene mm-hmm. in the Gold Rush where they just show five seconds yep. of Charlie making the Gold Rush and he's in the chicken costume, and then they cut away from it. It's like they built that whole set Absolutely. and all that stuff just to show it for five seconds. When I could have watched a movie that was four no, hours about the making right. of the Gold Rush, so and it makes you wonder, and the thing is, where's is the director's Robert cut of, of Attenborough's? Uh, um, I think he was Chaplin on, um, oh, 
it's a show on A and E uh, um, studio with um, James Lipton. Yeah, he was on that, and he said for a year he totally absorbed Chaplin. He watched yeah. his films, and he was coached by Dan Kane, and you know, and and he completely absorbed Chaplin. But if you think about it. There are very few scenes in that movie where Robert Downey Jr. is dressed as the Triumph. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like all of that work that he did, and for the most part, he was just shown as, you know, Charles Chaplin, the man, you know, because they went in a different direction uh, for the movie. You know, like I said, um, for me, it's like Charlie Chaplin led a long Full, very eventful life with many chapters. Oh. When you talk about Chaplin, you refer to the chapters mm-hmm. in his life. That, you know. That's how the musical did it. Like some parts they really emphasize, just like the movie, the biopic, and mm-hmm. others they completely like sped through, not giving too much time or just mentioning it in a lyric in one of the songs and then going on to something else. For instance, in uh, after the intermission, uh, they quickly sped through a bunch of Chaplin's life. Like uh, in the first uh, half of the first act of the musical uh, was an emphasis on uh, his first wife, Mildred Harris. And then once the second act began, they sped through Lita and Paulette Goddard, both of them, and immediately went to his last wife, Una O'Neill. And they talked they gave her more backstory than the biopic did. Uh, mm. They said that she was a debutante, which she was. They met right. her father was Eugene O'Neill. Eugene O'Neill wasn't too keen on uh, Chaplin, no, was he? No, he was not. Okay. Uh, Sarah, tell us about when you met uh, Rob McClure. Oh, yeah. So after the show, I really, really wanted to meet him. There was like a little bit uh, like auction going on, like pay X amount of money for like a charity and you can meet Rob McClure and have a tour backstage. Of course, there's way too much money. So I opted to just wait outside the theater doors. And I got to meet many of the cast members, including the woman who played Head Hopper. And she was so funny. She uh, signed my playbook playbill and complimented my purse and rode away on a razor scooter. <laughs> it was pretty yeah. fun. And uh, oh, the wow. woman who played um, O'Neill, her name was Erin Mackey. She was really sweet. I met uh, the person who played the kid, uh, both Jackie Fugan as well as young Charlie Chaplin, and he was probably seven or eight, and he was a sweet kid. There was many other people that I got to meet, and I was just waiting very patiently for Rob McClure to come out, and he finally did, and I was right there. Most people had left. They had given up, but I'd waited for 45 minutes in the cold with my dad to meet him, and he showed up, and he was so nice. He signed up my bill, took two pictures, one with me and one with my dad, and I talked about Chaplin and how much he means to me. And he told me pretty much how I think you you described as uh, Robert Downey Jr. being just immersed with Chaplin. Rob McClure did the same thing. Like his whole dressing room was just decked out in Chaplin. Uh, also, Rob McClure apparently, I believe, was trained by the same uh, person who trained Robert Downey Jr. for the biopic. Uh, to be the tramp, same person. Who actually, I got to meet um, Dan Kamen um, at a, a show that he did. Um, he's doing another one next week. Um, it was here in Florida. He's uh, he's a magician, he's a mime, and he's he loves Chaplin. And he wrote two books on him. One is called uh, Charlie Chaplin, One Man Show. And the other one is Charlie Chaplin, Artistry in Motion. And he talks about um, how Charlie Chaplin moves, um, how his makeup, I mean, all of that was designed, the, the way that, that he constructed his costume, the way that he constructed his makeup. And um, he did a show, and then he also showed um, the pawn shop. And it was me and my husband, and it was a bunch of elderly um, people. It, it was at uh, actually at some retirement village, I mean, a real fancy one. So uh, he played the pawn shop, and then we got to uh, 
discuss it. And it was amazing how many of those people uh, probably had never seen a Charlie Chaplin film, but they were still able to connect with what he was doing. You know what I'm saying? And um, I found that so impressed me how somebody can just watch a Charlie Chaplin film, you know, cold and just get something out of it. Then um, I met Mr. Kamen and I was falling all over myself. Like, you know, I was like so much in awe of him because anybody that loves Charlie Chaplin is good for me, you know. And I got to meet him and he was so, he was so nice. And um, he signed my book and um, it was just I don't know. Just to to meet somebody that's that, like you with um, Rob McClure, you know, to, yeah. to to find somebody that has that much admir admiration for him is just you know awesome. What it is too is yes. that when you meet other people who get it, it's such a breath yes. of fresh air because you're used to yeah. having to explain to everyone, and, and it's almost like an interrogation about it's, how you like Chaplin. Right, you almost exactly. have to explain exactly. yourself. You feel like you're put on the spot. And when you meet somebody who already understands, it just takes so much of the the yeah. pressure off to explain exactly. what the heck it's all it's about. You know, to, you like understand each other. ideas off each other and get different perspectives of Chaplin's art. Well, speaking from my personal experience, um, seeing Chaplin live, uh, I was at the Tampa Theater events that Anne was at. I saw uh, City Lights and I saw The Gold Rush. Well, it was it was an amazing experience because obviously I've seen those films over and over and over again, but seeing them with an audience and with other people is just a whole nother event on, all onto itself. And especially in a theater that's decked out all vintage and everything, it's something that you have to do yourself to actually experience. And I would say if you've never seen a silent film before and you're not sure if you would be into it, going to see a film live with an orchestra right, in yeah. an old theater, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that doesn't win you over, then there's no hope at all. And uh, I actually went to oh. the Chaplin Conference in Zanesville, Ohio in 2010, and that was just an amazing experience because you had people from all over the world that all love Chaplin that were giving uh, speeches on anything and everything about him. They had written papers. They had done reports. They had a segment where... They would show Chaplin films at the speed they are shown, and then they'd slow them down and show them how he actually recorded them before he sped them back up to see how he had timed everything in his films, how everything was perfectly right, timed. Right. But when it plays back at a faster speed, it looks like it's all chaotic. Oh, God, I love So that they name. had all these little things, and uh, <laughs> David Robinson was there. Oh, and they just showed they showed um, the kid at this really old theater in Ohio, and it was just a fantastic, oh, wow. fantastic thing. I almost didn't get to go because I got food poisoning the day before. And I remember thinking, if I don't feel better the next day, I mean, my hotel was paid for, the event was paid for, my plane ticket was paid for, and as much as I wanted to go, I was really bad. But luckily, I got better, and <laughs> that was had to be one of the imagine. most enjoyable I, I mean, trips I've ever taken was, in my life. You know, just because everybody was there. I mean, I wasn't a Chaplin fan, but I know so many people that went there, and wow. uh, oh, it sounded like it was amazing. Mm. I really hope that they do more of them. I know they did the thing in Italy yeah. last year for Chaplin's uh, centennial for the first Keystone mm -hmm. film, but. You know, I'm also a member of the International Al Jolson Society, and they have an event every single year somewhere. Yeah. I know. And I almost feel like they, they should do that for the Chaplin England, event, because I, I know they Bristol. get people. They, they always, every year they have a silent film festival. In Ireland, every, I believe, August in Kerry, um, they have a, a Chaplin event. So there's a lot of stuff going on across the pond, as they call it. Um, <laughs> not so much here. You know, it, it's... Uh, uh, because really, um, he's not as popular in the United States, and I don't know why, but he's not as I, he is no, in other countries. I know a lot of Keaton fans. Like I remember yes. last year, I introduced a Keaton film and a Chaplin film to one of my friends here, mm -hmm. and allowed him to decide. And he chose Keaton over Chaplin, which I thought, and, because he liked Keaton's athleticism more. And I can I I can understand that. I, I mean, my preference is towards Chaplin because yeah. that's how I was introduced to silent films. But you know what? Um, you should show him uh, 1 a.m. Oh, you yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. That's 
pure athleticism at its best, you know. Yes. But well, why do you feel that Chaplin isn't uh, maybe, as yes. renowned in the United like, States um, as he Jackson, is in other countries? Okay. Yeah. Because of everything that went on here, he lost a lot of popularity. But when he died, there was other parts of the world that they were grieving. They were beside themselves because they didn't really know all of that baggage that he had here. If I recall reading when um, Richard Attenborough was doing Chaplin, they were out in some remote area in California, like a desert type of town or whatever, maybe to shoot those scenes when he first went to a Keystone. But anyway, they went into like a general store to get soda or whatever. And um, the man behind the counter said to him, uh, said to them, what are you doing? And they says, you know, we're making a film about Charlie Chaplin. And the man says, and this is 15 years after Charlie Chaplin died. He goes, right. why are you making a film about that communist? Uh. So there's still that, you know, and of course, people, you know, um, and I, I, I don't even like to, to wow. talk about this part of his life, the personal side, but, you know, s some people call him, you know, a child molester because his wife is 16. That was not that unusual 100 years ago. But there's just certain things that people attach to him, and it's polarizing. Well, I don't even know if it's that anymore. I, it just, yeah. There's not a whole lot of events. I mean, even if you go to the Jim Henson studio, you know, you, th you think they have some... I mean, I know it's a working Ooh. studio, and they can't yeah. let everybody on there, but all the studios have... Right, These, right. Um, that, yeah, I've heard sightseeing that. Sightseeing tours that you can take, except the Henson Studio doesn't let people on, and you can walk around the building. But I mean, how amazing would it be if they let, you know, if you bought a ticket and they let a select group of people into the studio to have like a Chaplin film screening Supposedly, outside? Supposedly, uh, somebody had you know, gotten and into. You could sit they knew inside somebody the studio inside where he the, made the all these studio, films and you could and watch they posted them. Uh, the picture on Tumblr. But she actually went into this into the room where he edits his films. And it looks just the same. You know that wow. picture. You know that picture that you see a lot of him like holding up the film and, and he's looking at it. Um, that that room looks the same. So I mean, yeah, you're right. If they did stuff like that, and of course, um, here's the thing too: is that um, wow. a lot of dead celebrities um, have people that are in charge of their estates, and it's not necessarily family members. But there's some celebrities that are still making so much money, you know, Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe. The chaplain, I, I don't know if, if, if how it's being organized, but it just doesn't make the amount of money that other celebrities make. And I think it's because a lot of times there's just not that um, accessibility, you know, especially in, in this country. You can't go anywhere without seeing Marilyn Monroe on a T-shirt or Elvis Presley on a T-shirt. Right. Why is Chaplin not on a T-shirt at, it's you know, great. Hot Topic or Spencer's in the mall? People would buy that stuff. Even if they don't know necessarily who he is, they would know They would right. know enough to know who he is right. to think, oh, that's a retro thing. That's cool. I'll buy that. Because that seems to be all it takes these days for, you know, teenagers to buy something. There's just such yeah. a... But, you know... Uh, I feel like Chaplin's such is, an under, underappreciated homes, thing because I don't um, think his image is pushed out there as much as the it could be. is the United States and, and England. His statue that's in that... Uh, Leicester Square, I believe is the name of it. They moved that statue and it's like two blocks over. You know, they don't even respect this man and they moved his statue. Make way for progress. Well, they even just, I mean, this is not Chaplin related, but the Universal uh, Universal Studios in Hollywood, they just tore down the Phantom of the Opera set from 1925, which was the oh, God. oldest surviving movie set in, in history. Oh. And they tore it down to make way for a Harry Potter ride. Now, I also read something that they tore it down, but yeah. they also moved a huge portion of it to some museum where they're going to put it on display. And that's fine. You know, make way for the future, tear down the past. And that's how Hollywood is nowadays. I, you know, I've been there multiple times, oh. and there are many things that are in danger of being torn down just because they want to build a complex hey. here. They want to build a mall here. And it's uh -huh. just they have no respect for the things that, that made that city that what they it is. They, have, they don't. That, they could care less uh, at this point. There's some Just buildings down, behind. We're going to build something uh, else there. That were in Kid Auto Races, Chaplin's the Tramps debut film. Mm -hmm. it's two buildings in the very background of that film that 
are in jeopardy of being torn down right, to build, right. I believe, condos or something like that. Well, and there's luckily, a petition going on for it. Luckily, uh, the Chaplin studio was preserved. I mean, in 1969, so that was like, wow, pushing 50 years. So that's safe for now, you know. But a lot of them, uh, you're right, they just tear it down and – it goes back to me saying they, they, Hollywood has no respect for the people that came before them, you know, and it's, it's really unfortunate. Yeah, because well, without them, without the people that I came like before the them, they wouldn't even have the opportunity in, to do uh, what they're doing. That's how I feel. The industry definitely think a lot about the past and who came before them, like Chaplin and Hitchcock, all those people, mm -hmm. the, the people, the, the creative types in Hollywood today definitely care about the past but i'm not sure i'm not sure yeah well, they do not i, I want to say you know, that the I filmmakers really do but in the, 2011 the, uh, they had a silent the land movie the artist I and it won an academy award i feel it was, like it was, yeah, that was the I, first film since wings to win the first silent film since right. wings to win best picture i thought for sure here we go we're going to see a slew of these new types of films and then nothing I thought the exact same thing. I really did. Now, when you think about the artist, I was excited because I thought, like you, I was like, okay, now there's going to be a huge renewed interest in silent films. All these things are going to be popular again. Mm -hmm. But it was popular for a little while, and then it just dropped off the face of the earth. And I feel like that's how the movie industry yeah, is today. Right. A movie comes out, and it's all the rage for two weeks. And then... You never hear about it again, and no one talks about it anymore. And I, I know even when I was younger, you're, da you're when seriously movies came dating out, me, Nigel. But I mean, yes, I yes. wasn't around at this time, but when E.T. and right. Jaws and yes. Star Wars These came out, huge, they were in the theaters for the, uh, a year. And they stayed around for a very long time. You're right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sorry, but it's almost now. I mean, I know the first real example of this was when Batman 1989 came out. It came out right. in the movie theaters, and then Warner Brothers wanted to get it out on VHS as quickly as possible because they wanted right. to cash in on the Christmas. I think Batman came out in June, and they wanted the VHS out by December or November to get all those Christmas right. sales. Yeah. Well, that pissed off a lot of theater owners because they were still showing Batman in the movie theater, and that was really cutting into their sales. I think that was one of the fastest releases after it had been in the theater, while it was still in the theater in some places. And from then on out, it was just the time got shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah, and now it's true. almost like and then, a know, movie comes like, out in the I mean, theater kind of off and topic, they cannot wait to get I mean, it on a DVD because the they're afraid of people forgetting up about in it. Arms because they're making the uh, remake of the Gold Bus, um, the Gold Rush, the Ghostbusters, and it's yeah. really all, all female cast. And oh, people are losing it. The purest. That's what everybody's upset about. So it's, it, it's strange. It really is strange. But I thought for sure we'd see more, um, you know, s silent movies because it proved that people will sit in a theater. Well, you know what's going to happen with Ghostbusters is it's going to be all the yeah. rage when yeah. it comes out. Everyone's going to be talking about it. Oh, my God, are you going to go see it? It's going to come out. Everyone's going to go see it. And then no one's going to talk about it anymore. It's yeah. going to come out on yeah, DVD, and people are going to buy true. it, and then yeah. a couple years are going to go by, and no one's going to talk about it, and they're just yeah, going to go back to talking about the original okay. Ghostbusters. Let's see. Let's get back on topic here. <laughs> going back to Chaplin Live Events, um, it's not super Chaplin-related, but it kind of is. When I saw Mac and Mabel not too long ago, I had never seen the musical live before, and it was interesting because mm. I know so much about their real lives and their history how many things were condensed and uh, how many hist historical moments were just kind of thrown around willy-nilly to make it a more cohesive musical. The one thing I noticed the most that shocked me was the fact that in somewhere around 1921, <laughs> 1922, Mabel leaves Max Sennett and goes to a different studio. They make it sound like Max Sennett created the Keystone Cops because Mabel Norman left... Right the Keystone <laughs> studio, and he needed something to fill the void of her not being there, which when you think about it is crazy because he created the, the, the cops yeah. in, like, 1913. So when it comes to making musicals or biopics on people, yeah. it's, like, they have to but kind of take totally, someone's life story I mean, and condense it that into, exactly, like, a palatable 
two-hour event versus actually they would being tie it up like historically that. accurate on mm-hmm. everything. When when these things come out, what do you think about the families of the people that they're representing? Like, well, let's say, you know, Chaplin's well, actually, grandkids go to uh, see Chaplin when, the, musical. When he, Chaplin the are musical. Are they enjoying it for what it is? The or are they Chaplin looking at all these things and thinking, that's not right, that's incorrect? And he wouldn't I have think done that. they were all supportive of it. Because I'm not sure, hmm, that's a tricky question to answer. Because they have to let some things slide. At some point, if something does bother them, they will get offended, but they won't call it out in public. Oh, they are so, so protective of his image. It's on, like you know... That- well, the, I mean, uh, the Chaplin family, I mean, I'm sure, has I, I to approve everything before it's show. gone and, uh, through. In 1999, um, on, on, on his show, he had a clip where Josephine Chaplin actually went to Israel because there was this store in Israel that was selling lottery tickets, and it had the tramp's image on it, you know, and she huh? went there to put a stop to it. Her thing is her father represented so much good and he shouldn't be used to be selling lottery tickets. But it just goes to show they're very protective of his image. And I I think that if something was disparaging, they probably would have a problem with it. Now, I do know that, um, for instance, with Mabel Normand, um, Stevie Nicks just came out with a song. And uh, Mabel Norman's referenced in that song, and it references to her purported um, drug abuse. You know, her family is very upset about that, you know, because it's um, they're disparaging her. So, I mean, that that's like a really tricky thing, you know, especially when uh, people, family members are still alive. Well, it's right? funny when you mm-hmm. think about how in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when they made a biopic about someone, it was glamorizing them. It almost it suppressed all the negative, and right. it highlighted all the they good want, stuff. Okay. Now I feel like when they make a documentary, it highlights the negative stuff and surpa- and uh, suppresses the achievements that they accomplished. People love negative drama. I mean, you can just go to the grocery store and see uh, on the magazine racks, and that's all people want. The you know, what who's artists. having an affair and yeah, with and- who. Versus the good things that they're doing. They don't care about that anymore. It's all uh, sensationalism. And it's funny because when I'm talking about Mac and Mabel, the end of the film, I was wondering, or I'm sorry, the end of the show, I was wondering how they were going to talk about her her tuberculosis and her passing away at a young age and all that. And Mac's sitting there and he's talking about how things yeah. didn't go too well towards the end, but because yeah. he's Max Senate, he can direct his own version of how it should have ended. So at the end, Mabel comes back in and says she loves him, and they they embrace each other, and that's the end of the show, you know, a happy ending. So I feel like that's how they needed to end that, that musical on a high note, but it just goes to show you that even someone's his, history can just be right. changed, those, and you know how calls and long until a hundred years from now, well, if that's taken as the legitimate thing that happened have versus the real, you know, the they're real merely meant to entertain. Situation. Just like the movie that just came out this year, the Imitation Game about Alan Turing and code breaking during World War II at Bletchley right. Park. Um, there are a lot of inaccuracies of that, but it's merely for entertainment. It's a fictionalized, not completely glossed over, but slightly fictionalized version of the truth. The thing, though, with the Chaplin movie, uh, merely meant to, the Richard Attenborough Chaplin movie, the, the thing is, is that at the beginning of the film, if I'm, uh, if, exactly. if I'm correct, it puts that, that is based on, both David Robinson's book and Charlie Chaplin's, and yet there's stuff in there, and I'm like, that's not in yes. either one of those two books, you know. But like you mentioned or, um, earlier, um, or, or maybe uh, the last podcast, that's a podcast in and of itself. You know what I'm saying? I I get asked that a lot about what do I think of the Chaplin movie, and because you know people that are just new to him would be like, I, I thought it was wonderful, and you know I, I don't slam it, but it's just People Definitely. that know him look at it differently than people that are just learning about him. Yeah, 
learning yeah. about him don't know. For instance, when I watch the Chaplin biopic movie with someone who doesn't know Chaplin very well, I have to explain things or I'll correct things. Exactly. That, uh, for instance, I was very confused at the part that said that Mildred faked the pregnancy because uh, it confused me because she did eventually get pregnant. And right. they did have, I mean, the child died three days later, but they never mentioned it in the movie. And that and was a what? time for Chaplin, too. The thing is, too, is that um, the only mention of Lita Gray in that entire movie was Charlie Chaplin as, you know, Robert Downey saying she was a, a flawed human being. And then I see pictures of Lita Gray, who is now, I mean, she was really into her 80s, going to see the movie. And I'm thinking to myself, what must she have felt like to sit in that theater and watch yeah. this movie and then... The only mention of her is Robert Downey Jr. saying that. I was yeah. like, oh, my God. I, I would have been mortified. I would have actually. The like, autobiography does only give five lines. Like, Chaplin's right. autobiography he does dedicate five lines to her. And that is true. Yeah. And right. all he says is that I will not discuss her. My children are still alive, and I don't want to right. say right. anything while they're still around. That's their mother. Right. Right. Which is a high risk. What I will open up to the Facebook group and anybody that wants to comment after listening to this is what film would you want to see in the theater? What Chaplin film have you seen in the theater and what was your experience regarding that? What was the audience experience like? Um, did you bring anyone that had never seen a Chaplin film before to the event? Uh, did anything interesting happen? City Lights. Or if Absolutely. you've never City seen Lights. one in the I, theater, I, I, what I adore the would music be your number that. one pick for it's, something I, like that? I just uh, love Sarah, the, what would you? Um, what Chaplin it. film would you want to see it's in the theater that you haven't gotten a chance funny. to yet? It's American Film Institute's number one romantic comedy of all time. Right. On their to comedy top ten list, it's number one, and deservedly so. And I would just love to see it in the theater. I I would just Love to see the final scene on the big screen with uh, Virginia Cheryl and the flower. And just, it's so heartbreaking to watch, but I love that scene. And I would love to see it on the big screen. The kid, the kid. That, you know, that rooftop rescue, I could watch it on a loop. And that was the film that firmly cemented him that's the movie that sent him over into the stratosphere. I mean, yep. he was popular before, but this, the kid cemented that. And it was just that rooftop rescue. Oh my God. It gets yep. me all the time. I, I just, I just adore that movie. And, but it's heavy. It, it, it is a heavy movie. Yeah. It, it, it's a heavy movie, but yeah. that's the one that I, that, um, I would want to see. Um, what about you, Joe? Um, I've been lucky enough to see quite a few of them. I oh. would say, Ugh. honestly, the shorts. I'd love to see uh, the Keystones played in a live uh, theater yeah. setting with live music. Pretty much all of the... Oh, you know what? I haven't seen Modern Times. I'd like to see Modern Times live. Well, I, here's I the don't question. Know the answer. With Modern <laughs> Times, when it gets to the part where he's singing, does the orchestra yeah. play along with him, or does the orchestra just shut off and let that part of the film play? Yeah, that's, yeah. That'd be an interesting thing to, uh, I'm sure it's happened. I'm not sure if it's, uh, I'm okay. sure it's happened and been played somewhere like that. But it'd be really cool to see the orchestra playing live with Chaplin singing from the speaker. Yes. Yeah. So, all right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap this episode up. Thank you for listening if you've made it through this far. We had a lot of uh, technical issues regarding this episode because we're actually recording it on Super Bowl Sunday. You know, Thank you so much for anybody that's listening to this. We're, we are experts. We are not Chaplin experts. We're just fans. We know a lot about about him, but at some point we're sure to get something wrong. So right. if we get anything wrong, feel free to let us know. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're not reading out of a textbook. This is oh, just yeah, three definitely. Chaplin mm -hmm. friends, three Chaplin fans sitting around discussing one of the real passionate things that we have in our life. So we hope you enjoy listening to this, and if you have any suggestions yep. for future episodes right. or Bye -bye. things you'd like to hear, Bye. feel Bye. free to let us know and post about it on the Facebook page. Okay. okay. And we will be hearing from you soon.